The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda, John Michael McGrath and I with our weekly On Poly podcast. With uh, this example of Doug Ford and fourplexes, for example, uh, and I think we're, you know, you can see some of this happening in other provinces as well, is, is conservatives sort of polarizing against some of these housing policies precisely because they are Justin Trudeau's ideas, or in Ontario, it, it, we're talking about Bonnie Crombie as well. Partner, good to see you again. Good to see you, sir. I see we are sticking with the space theme. Uh, yes, uh, you know, had this one in the drawer, uh, NASA. Uh, I suppose I should say, given who I work for, not my favorite uh, government agency, but certainly a very close number two. A close number two to what? Uh, my employer, TVO. Uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what NASA stands for? National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Good for you, pal. Yes. I knew you'd know. I'm yeah. just setting you up to make you look good, which is not hard because you are good. <laughs> no, I mean... Very grateful to TVO for 10 years of employment, but I have loved NASA for a lot longer. Let me oh, put it okay. that way. I understand. <laughs> We're not going to comment about this because we may have a little something to say about what I'm wearing later. Uh, yes, indeed. Okay. And with that, let's head on to issue one. The federal government announced a new $6 billion infrastructure fund that will be part of its forthcoming budget. The fund is designed to get infrastructure built faster, but as we suggested off the top, there are strings attached to the money. JMM. Take us through it. Uh, so there's actually been uh, quite a few uh, substantial federal housing announcements in the last uh, week. They are um, issuing the old idea of saving everything for budget day, and they're just pre-announcing a whole bunch of stuff, uh, which I don't mind, actually. Mm. Um, but what we are talking about immediately is... Uh, uh, called the Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund. Uh, $1 billion will go towards improving things such as uh, wastewater systems. Um, the uh, remainder, about $5 billion or so, will be negotiated among uh, provinces and territories. Uh, but, uh, as is common with federal money, uh, there are some strings attached, which may ruffle some feathers, uh, particularly here in Ontario. One of the requirements that the federal government has talked about is requiring provinces to um, uh, force municipalities to allow uh, more buildings, such as fourplexes, uh -oh. which we've talked about recently. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the federal government would like provinces to, to require those um, uh, be allowed in municipalities. Here is how Premier Doug Ford reacted to that. See, the difference between ourselves and the federal government, and I, I want to work with them, I am working with them on a lot of different issues uh, on a daily basis. Uh, I don't believe in forcing municipalities. I believe in working with municipalities. I've walked a mile in their shoes, and Mayor Del Duca, he knows best where to put the housing, uh, not the province, or for sure, not the federal government. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. My, my, I think my head's about to... Did, did Premier Ford just say that the mayor of Vaughan, Stephen Del Duca, knows best? Uh, that's what he said. Okay, I, then I need to go on a little tangent here because <laughs> the Premier was up in Vaughan in York Region on Wednesday morning of this week announcing a new medical school for York University and he had effusive praise, effusive praise, quite over the top actually, for the guy he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with in a provincial election less than two years ago. Watch. I also want to acknowledge my good pal, Mayor Del Duca. And I always say this. So I, I had, what do we have, 22 mayors uh, uh, at the house one time in the summer. And I called him out. I don't know if I embarrassed him, but I said, I wish every mayor was like Mayor Del Duca. He, uh, he gets things done. He understands the system. And uh, when he comes over to the house, we sit in the outside, you know, in the, the solarium. But you should see how we smash a, a dozen cannolis back <laughs> real quick. I'll tell you, between him and I, it's, man, I'll, uh, and they're great cannolis by, uh, from Vaughn. He always brings a box of cannolis. And I, I bring the Tim Horton Timbits, so. <laughs> He's having him over to his house now? Uh, apparently. I, I mean, <laughs> look, I, I love a good Timbit, but I will say if <laughs> Mayor Del Duca is bringing cannolis and Premier Ford is bringing Timbits, uh, Mayor Del Duca is, is really bringing the better gift. You're there. going with the cannolis. The cannolis are good. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Um, you know, 
quite a, a, a change in tone for the election, I think we <laughs> could think? say. Um, and yet, uh, this is also a trend we have seen with the premier before, where once uh, the opposition leaders are out of provincial politics, he's able to, you know, mend fences with them. You know, we've seen it with uh, clearly with Stephen Del Duca. Uh, we've seen it with uh, Andrea Horvath, now mayor of Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've seen it with uh, Patrick Brown in Brampton. Uh, these are all people whom Ford has gone uh, toe-to-toe with, in some cases in very acrimonious ways while they were uh, rivals in the provincial political scene. And now it's bygones. (laughs) bygones. <laughs> Which is a beautiful thing in a way, because obviously you would like people to be able to uh, sheathe their swords and do the public's business without previous entanglements affecting them. And apparently the feeling is mutual with Stephen Del Duca, uh, who two years ago was saying that Doug Ford was unfit to be the premier of the province of Ontario. He's got a bit of a different tune now. Have a listen. You know, I don't think it was that long ago, maybe a few years ago now, when a lot of people across Ontario would have found this scene, this very scene, me standing at a podium thanking Doug Ford. (laughs) You didn't even wait for the punchline there. (laughs) And I have to tell you, since becoming mayor of this city, I have found Premier Ford to be an extraordinarily accessible and welcoming partner on so many different fronts. I mean, your head truly wants to explode with the, with, I mean, it, it just reminds me of my favorite line, you know, which is where you stand depends on where you sit. Yeah. And these guys are obviously sitting in different places right now. Uh, they, they used to go after each other, hammer and tongue, and now they're BFFs. Yes. So go figure. Anyway, uh, th- that aside, that little <laughs> tangent aside, let's get back on the path. Doug Ford has made clear his feelings about four plexes in the past few weeks, uh, has not missed an opportunity to say that he doesn't think, therefore, this province uh, he's against. Uh, What about a three-year freeze on development charges? That was also included in the federal government announcement. Take us through some of that. So this is an interesting one because um, while the federal government's announcement in theory applies to all provinces equally, not all provinces rely on development charges to the same extent that Ontario does. Um, Some provinces are closer to us than others, but if you think of Quebec right next door, uh, development charges are very, very minimal there. Uh, You know, municipal infrastructure is still primarily paid for by uh, property taxes or provincial grants, that kind of thing. Um, Ontario relies on development charges much more than many other provinces. So uh, freezing development charges by extension affects this province more than it would others. Uh, We have some estimates of how much uh, uh, total development charges are in Ontario. In 2018, municipalities collected approximately $2 billion from these uh, charges that they used to, you know, build, uh, in some cases, road and sewer infrastructure. In other cases, it's parks and libraries, that kind of thing. That's not chump change. $2 billion no, is real money. $2 billion a year is, is real money. Mm-hmm. Um, freezing those fees obviously could uh, limit how much money cities are able to raise from new housing. And of course, the point to all of this policy is to try and get lots of new homes built. Uh, But I I think it's important to say that, uh, at least reading the federal announcement uh, in its sort of plain meaning, they're not saying that uh, fees should be cut or uh, much less zeroed out. They're just saying, like, freeze them at the current level and don't increase them further. you know, in the city of Toronto, for example, uh, development charges really have gone up quite a bit in uh, certainly the last 10 years and, and even before that. Uh, so uh, if, if everybody can sort of take a breath and just freeze development charges, I think the feds are arguing that that would be good to get more ha- homes built in uh, these municipalities. Do I have this right that they've got until January 1st of next year to come to all these agreements? So how do we see all this rolling out? Yeah, so they're going to work over the next year to uh, hammer out these agreements. And I think, you know, if you think back to um, the uh, agreements that the provinces came to on uh, daycare, uh, obviously people may remember that Ontario was relatively late to signing an agreement uh, with mm-hmm. the federal government on that one. I believe we were the last province or territory yep. to do so. Um And we might see something uh, similar again. Uh, 2025, of course, under current law, uh, has to be a federal election year. Maybe not. Okay, well. (laughs) Maybe not. There's a loophole in that act. I was talking to some people about it last night. You just never know. They might go all five years. You never know. So very briefly, we'll just say... (laughs) Calling elections is a prerogative of the crown, and there's a, an open debate as to whether fixed election dates can actually bind the the crown in this kind of a way. Um, I don't think we'll necessarily see that be tested, but honestly, I've been wrong before. Um, anyway, back to housing <laughs> policy. 
Um, we have seen, talking about negotiations with the provincial governments, we've already seen a lot of skepticism from uh, largely provincial uh, conservative premiers um, who, you know, predictably say that uh, Ottawa is wading into matters of uh, provincial jurisdiction. And they're not wrong. This mm -hmm. is a, an area of uh, provincial jurisdiction. Um, I'd say the one notable exception here is uh, British Columbia, uh, which both, I, uh, I would say, a lot of housing advocates would say BC has really been leading the pack in terms of changes to housing policy. Uh, and uh, Housing Minister uh, Ravi Kalon said earlier this week, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, basically, if other provinces don't want this money, BC is happy to take it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can see the benefit there. Mm -hmm. um, one big question that we don't have an answer to yet is, uh, despite the, the initiatives that have been announced today, or rather this week, I should say, um, how much wiggle room is the federal government willing to give other provinces? Is is four plexes everywhere uh, a, a bright red line that uh, the feds are going to really insist on? Or is there some room to negotiate? Uh, our colleagues at the Trillium have reported that the Premier's office believes there is some room to negotiate, that Ontario might still get uh, its share of this uh, five or six billion dollars. Um, but, you know, that that remains to be seen, just exactly how much room there is to negotiate. Well, we do remember several months ago, the Prime Minister himself said, you know, housing is a provincial responsibility. And he kind of got chastised for saying that. Uh, you are quite correct. The Constitution says it is a provincial responsibility. And yet here the feds are diving in deep. What do you think? Well, so uh, let me uh, just add one caveat here. Of course, uh, the Constitution is, is silent on the issue of housing, right? The uh, housing involves areas of both federal and provincial jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the prime minister correctly said that a lot of what we talk about in housing is our areas of purely provincial jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But uh, and we'll talk about this a bit more later in the uh, your column, my column bit, but there are areas like banking regulation, which are absolutely tied up in uh, federal power and housing. So um, on this matter of the federal government let's call it trying to bribe the provinces <laughs> into uh, making good policy changes. Um, you know, I, I, I like this idea and I'm sort of honor bound to say that uh, because in 2021, uh, I wrote that the federal government should do exactly this. Uh, we remember that for uh, a few years now, the federal government has been uh, writing checks to municipalities um, and uh, uh, housing, federal housing minister Sean Fraser has uh, done a few of these now where they've they've convinced some, some of the larger municipalities in Canada to, to make substantial policy changes. And uh, But when the, the government first announced this in 2021, I said like, okay, it's a good idea. Uh, but the provinces can make all of these changes faster mm -hmm. and they can make them more broadly than the, the federal government going by and, you know, um, uh, having to negotiate with every single municipal council in Canada. Um, the Liberal, uh, this is called the, the Housing Accelerator Fund, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, you know, um, it, it's, it's a substantial amount of money. Uh, but I guess the, the other thing I will say is, I could be wrong. <laughs> Has that happened before? Oh, more times than I care to admit. <laughs> um, you know, in 2021, I, 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 I argued that it would be faster for the federal government to just bribe 10 provinces as opposed to hundreds of municipalities. But I was also more optimistic back then that even conservative provincial governments would be willing to take the money and make a bunch of what are like pro-market housing reforms. Mm -hmm. um, and instead, what we've seen, uh, I mean, with uh, this example of Doug Ford and fourplexes, for example, uh, and I think we're, you know, you can see some of this happening in other provinces as well, is, is conservatives sort of polarizing against some of these ha housing policies precisely because they are Justin Trudeau's ideas. Or mm. in Ontario, it, it, we're talking about Bonnie Crombie as well, right? Uh, conservatives are uh, uh, leaning against ideas that they perceive as liberal coded, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, I mean, the idea is to wedge the other guy by taking a, a position on something and saying, if you're not for our very popular position, then you're obviously against and therefore, yeah. anyway, you try and pigeonhole somebody in a corner. I, one thing we have not heard, we know what the debate is. We know that Trudeau and those who agree with him are for fourplexes. We know Doug Ford has come out very strongly against fourplexes, saying they're inconsistent with existing neighborhoods. We got some polling on this. But let's see what the people have to say. We do. Uh, so a recent poll by Abacus Data uh, gives us uh, at least some data to work with. Um, that firm asked respondents whether they supported so-called a gentle density on their block. So not just asking people whether they support the idea in theory, but would you be willing to uh, support it, uh, you know, 
very close to where you live, like in your backyard almost. Um, and uh, they asked the, the question uh, nationwide, but uh, the Ontario numbers were basically 30% opposed, 37% supported gentle density, and 34% were neutral. So well, you know, obviously it's not like super majority strong support for this policy. It's also not clear that there's a massive block of voters who are, you know, absolutely inimically opposed to this idea either. No, it, it looks frankly like there's a whole, t I mean, it's basically a third, a third, a third, yeah. because if you take the margin of error into account, it's basically a third, a third, a third, which suggests to me that there's a third of the people out there that are persuadable. And that means if you make a good argument, uh, you can bring them onto your side. We know the premier is trying to make what he would see as a good argument. Um, how's he doing with that? Well, you know, we talked a bit about why the Premier is opposed to fourplexes uh, last week, and I'm not going to repeat too much there except to say that, you know, I think some of this is just, you know, his sincere uh, uh, belief about, you know, how we should treat communities and, and the, the, the community that he comes out of as a, an Etobicoke resident and a, a longtime Etobicoke politician. Um, one other thing that I didn't mention last week that I want to sort of key in on here is that Doug Ford, you know, started in municipal politics. And that's a very common story for a lot of MPPs, right? Mm -hmm. You get started in municipal politics and then you make your way to Queen's Park. And while I don't think that planning politics are like super important in the uh, in most provincial elections, right? I, I, I don't think a government wins or loses an election based on planning politics most mm -hmm. of the time. Um, in municipal politics, where the elections are smaller and they are generally lower turnout, you know, a few hundred people in your ward who are really angry about, you know, some tower that got approved or something like that, they can absolutely swing an election. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things you do see is uh, people learning that lesson early on in their political career and then carrying it with them to Queen's Park in a way that maybe isn't actually uh, properly adapted to the new political context they're in. Mm. That's a great debate that will continue, and in the meantime, we are on to issue two. Okay, we know the federal government recently dramatically cut back the number of visas they were prepared to grant to foreign students to come to study in Canada, and that meant Ontario's public and private colleges and universities were anxiously awaiting to see how the visas were going to be allocated. The news for private colleges is very tough. Basically, almost all of the visas are going to go to students who will be enrolled in the public post-secondary system, like uh, upwards of 95 percent. There's been a lot of concern about the private career colleges uh, offering... I don't want to be defamatory here, but like, you know, the concern is that they've been offering a substandard education, that they've in fact been exploiting uh, international students. Mm -hmm. um, Federal Immigration Minister Mark Miller uh, referred to them as puppy mills and uh, not in an affectionate I love puppy kind of ways. <laughs> mm -hmm. One of the things I find interesting about this is that we know Doug Ford is a champion of the private sector. He is a progressive conservative premier, and he often puts the accent on the conservative part of the name of his party. Uh, but pretty clearly here, the public post-secondary system is being favored with this visa situation, and the premier is not going to bat for the private system, which I don't know if there's an explanation behind it, but I find it intriguing. Let's put it that way. Uh, no, it is intriguing. At that press conference in Vaughan the other day, uh, the premier said he'd like to prioritize uh, Ontario students uh, going to Ontario universities and colleges and uh, would like to get rid of the 18% uh, or so of uh, enrollment who are international students. Um, you know, removing those visa slots from uh, career colleges is, I think, going to have a very clear and immediate impact is a good way to reduce the, the the number of international students. But, you know, just to put this back in context, I mean, part of the incentive for uh, private colleges, but also public sector colleges and universities to rely on international students is because of the tuition cap mm -hmm. that this government has uh, initially imposed and, and now maintained for uh, five or six years now without being able to raise money from that 82%, I guess, of enrollment who are domestic students, uh, they rely very heavily on international students whom they can charge uh, whatever they want. Um, and now, I think, you know, obviously the government had announced money in the budget to support the post-secondary sector. Uh, we still don't know exactly how things are going to play out in the sector mm -hmm. uh, for the next several years. I mean, it's I, I think... Everybody acknowledges, even with the federal uh, funding, or sorry, pardon me, the provincial funding in the last budget, uh, it's going to be 
a lean few years in Ontario's colleges and universities. Oh, no question. They're looking at $3 billion in cuts over the next uh, couple of years. So some rubber is going to hit the road in a very harsh way. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 we will keep an eye on it, but it, it's going to be tough. <laughs> For sure. And with that, on to issue three. We just wanted to do a quick by-election check-in because Ontarians in two ridings are waiting to find out when they can replace two MPPs who have left Queen's Park for greener pastures, and we found out this week. So, tell us about, this is a long riding name, Lambton, Kent, Middlesex in southwestern Ontario, and then Milton, just about an hour from here. Right, uh, so the two by-elections for those ridings have been called, or uh, because we love to use the technical formal language here, uh, writs have been issued. The writs have been issued, not dropped, everybody. They have been issued. We've talked about this before. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So under the Election Act, elections uh, must be called on a Wednesday and held on the fifth Thursday after the date of the announcement. We all knew that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't know yeah. stuff like this? They also have to be called no later than six months after a vacancy occurs in the legislature. And in this case, the government waited about as long as it legally could to call the by-election in Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, which was the riding that was vacated by uh, former Labour Minister Monty McNaughton mm -hmm. back in October. Uh, actually, I, I just checked the dates uh, yesterday while we were working on this, and he... Uh, he waited until October 3rd so that he served exactly 12 years, I think. In the legislature. In, yeah, it was huh. because he, he was sworn in on October 3rd, uh, 2011 and uh, resigned on October 3rd, uh, 2023. 12 years to the day. I believe so. There's yeah. something poetic about that. I'm not sure what it is, but <laughs> something. Uh, so with the by-elections uh, called on the day they were, the voting day will be May 2nd, just about a month away. How, uh, I mean, I know this is a cliched question, but the reality is by-elections are all either extremely crucial, very important, a sign of the times, or they mean nothing. So <laughs> let, let, let's figure it out. Let's have that discussion here. Right. So, um, just mathematically, these by-elections cannot affect the uh, status of the Ford government's majority in the legislature. Uh, they could lose both seats and it, it would not affect their uh, their majority is still large enough that they would still control the, the, the legislature. Um, made a bit of a crack about this last week as well, but it also can't change the status of the Liberal Party. Were they to hmm. win both uh, seats, they would still be one seat short of uh, recognized party status in the legislature. Um, nevertheless, you know, by-elections can be uh, useful signals for uh, political parties. Um, it's, it's a chance for voters to sort of take a little poke at the government um, in a context where it doesn't threaten to trigger a, a general election or a massive change in, in government policy or anything like that. It's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a way for voters to, you know, maybe turn on the check engine light for the government mm -hmm. and, and, you know, hey, here's some things you need to pay attention to. And we've seen this before in provincial politics where, you know, I think of... Um, when uh, Raymond Cho won in, oh gosh, what was that now, 2017, uh, maybe uh, 2016. Um, but it was viewed at the time uh, by the Liberal government as a sign that the uh, electricity issue could no longer be ignored. And after that by-election win, they became much more focused on on really uh, trying to, to bore down on, on the issue of electricity prices. Um, so that's the kind of thing that, that can happen. We'll see what happens uh, with the results of these by-elections. But, you know, they can surprise both uh, political parties in the legislature. They can also surprise observers like us. Um, you know, uh, we saw the recent Green win in, in Kitchener Center. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, one that I, I think even a few weeks before it happened, we were it's not necessarily the outcome that you would have predicted. Took that seat from the NDP. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, the, the Liberal win in uh, Kanata Carlton uh, not too long ago with uh, Karen McCrimmon. Um, you know, that was a, an interesting case where uh, the the uh, former progressive conservative had uh, left suddenly and there was a, a lot of local issues. Oh, I, I will say, actually, I mean, I know I just said in the last segment that, you know, local super uh, uh, specific planning matters don't always uh, uh, shift elections or you know, but in that Canada Carlton by election the issue of whether a golf course should be redeveloped into housing was actually one of the big issues um, uh, for that by election in Milton one of the things that they will be talking about is I believe it's a, a proposed landfill or a quarry the quarry yes yeah. um, so you know by elections are those cases where those super local issues really can matter a great deal uh, 
And I, I was just going to say the interpretation yeah. matters a lot, too, because yes. these are two f seats formerly held by the conservatives. If the conservatives hold these seats, a lot of people will be tempted to say, oh, no story here. They, they were conservative seats. They are still conservative seats. You do have to dive into the numbers, though, yes. uh, because if the liberals are unusually competitive in losing in the southwestern Ontario one, that might be a sign of something. Or if they, you know, if they do well in Milton, again, even in a losing effort in a seat held by a former conservative cabinet minister, you know, that may portend something. So you never know. No, absolutely. And, you know, the difference between uh, losing by 20 points versus losing by five points um, you can spin that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and you know, it, it's easy to get lost in the crosstabs sometimes mm -hmm. when you're like reading polls too closely um, and, and people can sort of write whatever story they want in some cases. But I, I do think it's, it's, it's good. Like in the case of, you know, Kitchener Center, we mentioned, you know, the fact that uh, the NDP uh, you know, didn't come second in a seat that they held, right? They, they came way back. I so and the Liberals came way back, and the Tories, you know, like the, mm -hmm. that was, you know, it's right. noteworthy. Actually, I'm sorry. I think the NDP did come in second because it was the Liberals came far back that, in, in Kitchener Center. The magic of editing will take care yeah. of all of this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me jump in with this. Do we have any polling on any of these races? So glad you asked, Steve. Uh, we do, in fact, have a recent poll this week from uh, Liaison Strategies, and it's functionally a, a, a statistical tie in Milton um, and a, a substantial Tory lead in Lanton, Kent, Middlesex, which, I mean, I won't necessarily speak for you, but it's about what I would have expected going mm -hmm. into this. I, I think we are generally expecting Milton to be more competitive uh, than uh, the seat in southwestern Ontario. Uh, McNaughton had held that seat for a very long time. Twelve years to the day, I hear. Y yes, indeed. <laughs> and he, um, uh, you know, he he was a very uh, popular MPP for that riding. And, I, I, you know, it's the kind of riding where, to be blunt, the Liberals have struggled uh, ever since the 2011 election. And yet and Bonnie Crombie was there. She's gone in there the past, uh, I don't know if it was last weekend, but the weekend before that, she was in there door knocking. So they're not giving up on it. No, no. And this is why I say, you know, the difference between losing by 20 points or losing by five points, I mean, that'll be the kind of thing that we're looking at in Lampton, mm -hmm. Kent, Middlesex. Right on. Okay, up next, our favorite op-eds from the past week. Okay, it's time now for a little feature we like to call Your Column, My Column, in which JMM and I reminisce about some of the columns that we wrote this past week. And before I ask you what you wrote about, I want to tell you a little story here. Because okay. I had a couple of nights ago, I was at McMaster University in Hamilton at a place called Wilson College doing a panel discussion about uh, leadership and young people and advice and how they can get involved in politics and leadership, that kind of stuff. And after it was over, I was out in the foyer just sort of mingling with people. And two young people... I want to get their names right. Haley Kapinski and Ori Epstein, who are students there, came up to me, and it was one of those kind of fanboy moments. <laughs> they were looking at me like, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, other than to say, they both came up to me and said, we love your podcast. Oh, we love the On Poly podcast, and they love you, and they want. And so I said, kids, you make sure you listen this week, because we're going to give you a shout out, and we're grateful that you're listening. So Haley and Ori, two thumbs up from the both of us Thank here. You. So that having been said, what do you got for this week? Uh, so we've already talked about some of the, the federal uh, housing announcements, but uh, I wrote earlier this week about uh, one of the previous announcements. Uh, the government is intending to bring in a, a, a charter of tenants rights, a, a, a rental charter of rights, if you will. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to be sort of the wet blanket. And uh, I, I wrote about how I, I don't expect this to amount to much uh, because uh, this is one of those areas where uh, we are talking about something that is exclusively provincial jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And the federal government can try and entice provinces to play along with something like this. But as we've already seen with the fourplex issue, uh, particularly the, the uh, I would say, the conservative premiers uh, across Canada, not just Doug Ford, uh, th they are not making it easy, let me put it that way, for the mm. federal government. And uh, I'm, I'm skeptical that uh, this is going to amount to much before uh, the next uh, federal election. There are other measures that, you know, I mentioned banking. And uh, the the government has also announced, sorry, the federal government has also announced that uh, they want to uh, see renters get credit uh, on their credit scores, uh, the, get points basically for uh, rental payments that are made on time. Uh, currently, 
I own a home. I make mortgage payments. Every payment that I make on time is uh, counted towards my credit score. If I were a renter, that would not be the case. The federal government would like that to change. Hmm. And they do directly regulate banks. So in theory, that's something that they can really pull a lever on, except that the, the specific instrument that they are using is not something that actually compels the banks to do anything. It's all um, voluntary compliance, if I could put it that way. So even there, a measure where I think you you, you know you can say that Ottawa really has a, a direct lever to pull, we'll see how uh, how effective it actually is. That's a very McGrath column, deep in the, <laughs> deep in the weeds of nerddom. You know, I, I have a brand to maintain. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, th- this past week, I um, well, let me start by saying this. You know, I'm born and raised in Hamilton, and I, I go. It's come up a few times. It's come up a few times. <laughs> I go in most weekends and visit my dad, who still lives there. He lives right near uh, City Hall in downtown Hamilton, and uh, we went out for a walk a couple of weekends ago, and we walked by City Hall. And if you have not done that in Hamilton lately, you will be shocked by what you find. There is a tent city, in effect, that has taken over City Hall Square uh, because there are a lot of homeless people in Hamilton who have nowhere to live. And they have decided, I think in part to make a political point, that that's where they're going to live. And so, you know, I said to my dad, let's walk over and talk to some of the folks there, which we did. And I met a 35-year-old woman named Amanda who lives in a tent in that square with her boyfriend. And uh, we had, I don't know, 15, 20 minute conversation about why she's there. I asked her what percentage of the people living in City Hall Square are facing addiction and mental health issues. She said 100%. She's one of them. She had what you might call a very nice normal life once upon a time. Lived in a nice apartment, three kids, married, had a nice job. Something happened. She's now got addiction issues that she needs to deal with. She ended up, you know, this is a, truly a portrait of homelessness that um, that I think the column that I've written uh, helps to, it helps us understand it better, you know? She lost her apartment through renovation. She couch surfed with a couple of friends for a few months and then ended up on the street and now is at City Hall Square. And, you know, th- there was a time when she was living in a park in the North End And I think she said she saw one shooting, four stabbings, somebody get a hatchet in the head, four tents set on fire. There were two rival drug gangs who were trying to have control of the drug trade in that area. And they were basically at war with each other. And these poor homeless folks were caught in the middle of this whole thing. So anyway, the column focuses on Amanda, her efforts to get some serious housing. The you're going to forgive me for saying this, but it's a terrible image for Hamilton to see all those tents in City Hall Square as you walk into City Hall. It does. It's not a good look for the city. So I think bottom line, a lot of decision makers need to be a lot more imaginative in what they do there because the status quo stinks. I can tell you that. Can can I get on a soapbox for a moment? Go ahead. Uh, There are millions of possible explanations for homelessness that people will glom on to. Uh, you know, I, I have reported from Toronto City Hall in a, a prior part of my career, and people will will talk about all of them. Uh, the academic research on this is reasonably clear that uh, homelessness is primarily a problem of housing scarcity, yeah. that uh, when uh, housing is too expensive, uh, everybody bids for wherever they can in the housing sector, and the, the poorest people are simply pushed out of housing altogether and the the places where it like yes there are drug and mental health issues but the places where drug addiction is the worst are not the places with the worst homelessness places where uh, mental health outcomes are the worst are not the places with the the worst rates of homelessness the places where housing is the most expensive are the places with the worst homelessness yeah and that includes toronto that includes hamilton that includes basically all of canada's large cities at this point and so uh uh, there are any number of reasons for us to get serious and more serious about housing policy. Uh, the the uh, homelessness problems in uh, Canadian cities are uh, just one of the most visible ones. Well, i got to say as well, Haley and Ori, who I was talking to at McMaster the other day, when I said, why do you listen to podcasts? What do you like? You know, what do you, I'm doing a little focus group. What do you like? What do you don't like? And they said, we like the your column, my column. You guys talk <laughs> about your columns, and then we actually go to the website and look them up and read them. So if you want to know why we do this, that's why we do this. Okay. And with that, shall we go to the mailbag? Let's go to the mailbag. Let's do it. 
If you've got a burning question or insightful comment, then send it along to onpoliticsattvo.org. And JMM, why don't you kick us off this week? Absolutely. We have an email from listener Nick Spohr in Toronto who writes, Hi there. I ran as provincial candidate in the former Halton riding in the 2011 and 2014 provincial elections, prior to it being named Milton, both times against liberal Indira Naidu Harris. Indira was always a joy to have as a competitor, and she is a lovely person. I also distinctly remember getting out the vote on election day in Milton and seeing Z Hamid working the same street for the liberals. <laughs> he is now, of course, going to be the PC candidate. Yes. It's funny how the world works sometimes. <laughs> In the latest edition, you missed out on a golden fun fact to tie together the Milton by-election story, and I really like this. Steve had guessed that it was E.C. Drury who was the last premier not to hold a seat at the time of winning an election. Drury did not run in the 1919 election and had to run in a by-election in 1920 to claim a seat. And which riding was that in? Halton. Aha! In fact, a Milton High School was named in Drury's honor because of this, which many of my friends had attended and a member of my former campaign staff even taught at. I graduated from Milton District High School. How about that? Keep up the fun facts, Nick Spore. This is why I love our listeners. You know, they are so smart. And although we know a few things about Ontario politics, we don't know everything. Absolutely. And they fill in the blanks. That is beautiful. Nick, great letter. Thank you so much for that. Okay. And now we have an email from listener Wendy Feldman, also in Toronto, who writes... Hi, I'm the proud parent of a recent university grad who just started paying back a student loan from OSAP. In May 2023, the federal government waived interest fees on its loans through the National Student Loan Service. Several provinces did the same. British Columbia, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador do not charge interest on the provincial portion of their student loans. Hmm. Why does Ontario still charge students interest on OSAP? That's the uh, Ontario Student Assistance Program. Uh, OSAP loans at prime plus 1%. Or about 8% at the moment. Love the show. Wendy. Okay, good question there. Um, let's do a little background here. Back in May 2023, the federal government, as we heard, eliminated the interest portion on the students' loans that they're responsible for. Ontario, as she said, has not done the same. Premier Ford could, if he wanted to, eliminate the provincial portion of interest on OSAP loans. Why doesn't he? <laughs> so, uh, the premier uh, and his government uh, did cut tuition rates at the outset of their government uh, early on in 2019. They have kept those tuition rates frozen uh, for the uh, ensuing five years. <laughs> That's not without its problems, as we talked mm -hmm. about. Um, they, you know, the government would say those are clear savings for the students. Um, it is possible to uh, pay off the OSAP portion of the loan first, so you essentially eliminate the, the chunk of debt that is the, the interest-bearing debt. Um, as for why they are not eliminating it entirely, as other provinces have, well, I mean, those kinds of policies do have costs, right? The, the government is uh, literally banking on having that stream of income come in from uh, Ontario students. And we've talked before, I think, about the you know finance minister, Peter Bethlenfalvy, and one of the, the lines I've used about him is that you know, he really is a finance minister who believes that if you watch the pennies, the dollars take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so while this amount of money that we're talking about in the provincial budget is not like a huge sum and it's not going to make the difference between a deficit or a surplus in 2026. Uh, he really does believe that you don't sort of give away even small sums like that um, without a very good reason. And clearly uh, the Ford government is not convinced of any of the reasons right now. And yet he'll give away $7 billion to subsidize people <laughs> electricity. You knew I was about to say that. Anyway, there we go. I'm going to sit back on my soapbox. Sorry about that. Okay, keep her going. Right. Uh, we received, a, speaking of the hydro rebate, we bunch, have received a bunch of emails uh, last week about uh, your um, uh, proposal, your uh, irritation. About it's creed. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, provincial hydro rebate. I'm going to highlight this one from listener Matthew Adams from Newcastle, uh, about an hour east of Toronto, uh, who writes... Hello, Steve. I'm wondering if this $8 refund on hydro is one of those things that would cost more to means test than just to give it to everyone. I believe there are quite a few programs that are means tested um, so that once you look at how much it costs to exclude people, you realize it would actually be cheaper just to give them the money. Just a thought I'm sure you've had, but I wonder if it holds water here. Matthew, thank for that. Uh, it's a very fair question, and I've looked into that. I've asked finance officials and experts about whether it is too complicated to means test these subsidies and whether it's cheaper just to give it to everybody? And the answer is, apparently, no, it's not. It's not complicated or expensive at all. The government can claw back subsidies from higher income individuals on their tax returns. It is easy peasy, lemon squeezy. 
And until some government does that, we're going to continue to spend seven point. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before. Seven point three billion dollars subsidizing the hydro bills for a lot of people who don't need, or I might even say deserve the help. And I say that as one of those people. I don't need the eight to nine dollars a month to help subsidize my hydro bills. So Okay, that's I, I, I know I got to get over. I'm just going to give you a minute to get the blood pressure back down. <laughs> Thank you. Focus, focus, focus. Okay. Calm blue ocean. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have another email from Brian with an I Lewis. <laughs> okay. Who writes? Uh, Thanks for the identity clarification last week. Even if I feel bad to disappoint Steve that it was not the former NHL referee commenting <laughs> on the podcast. Uh, also, kudos on the budget coverage. Really respect the in-depth understanding and reporting on so many important and complex issues. It was great to hear JMM talk about the social assistance amount that are not indexed. I would add that the cost of living at the poverty line has risen about 20% since 2018, the last time these amounts were increased. And you'll like this, Steve. I also share Steve's grievances over the massive cost of here, taxpayers here. of electricity here, subsidies, here. which surely the government could commit to gently phasing out. Gently phasing out or eliminating all of... I don't know. They could figure that out. Anyway, that is Brian Lewis, who's the former... Chief Economist, Assistant Deputy Minister in the Office of Economic Policy in the Ontario Ministry of Finance, where he was from 2015 to 21. Not the Brian with a Y, Lewis, the former National Hockey League referee. And naturally, Brian with an I, you are totally right about the electricity <laughs> subsidy, and uh, we are on the same page on that one. Now, finally, we have something special. We have not emails. We have actual mail. Actual physical mail. Physical mail. A mailbag. Okay, man, will you look at that? It's, it's a mailbag. Do you want to open up the mailbag and see what's in there? Oh, sure. Well, here. Take a look. All right. So this is a letter from Paul Vanderham in Mississauga, Ontario. Beautiful. Put that down there. Is that okay? Um, and uh, shall I read or? All yours. Okay. Uh, dear JMM and SP, as a <laughs> lifelong nerd, I take umbrage with Steve Pakin's assertion that Highway 17 starts in Nipigon from the Your March 22nd podcast. Highway 17, also known as the Trans-Canada Highway, historically ran from the Quebec border to the Manitoba border, a distance of 2,129 kilometers, according to the Pro Provincial Highways Distance Table 1989. A section of Highway 17 east of Ottawa was downloaded to the regional municipality of ottawa Carleton and the counties of Pre Prescott and Russell in the late 1990s. Ottawa has since rebranded their portion as Road 174. At present, the eastern terminus of Highway 17 is somewhere west of Arne Prior in Renfrew County, where the current provincial government's program of twinning the highway and rebranding it as Highway 417 continues at a bucolic pace. Uh, bucolic. I love the word nice. bucolic. It's a great word. Yeah. As a gift, I have enclosed two copies of Ontario's <laughs> official roadmap from the Bill Davis era. Oh my gosh, look at these. You will note that the earlier version from the late <laughs> 1970s is unilingual, and the later version from the early 1980s is bilingual. Kind regards, Paul Vanderham, who I believe is a PA, so that's professional engineer. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, exactly right. Um, okay, uh, obviously this. First of all, thank you for that letter. This is great. We love when our when our yeah. <laughs> Even when they disagree with me, I think it's great. And we should say that you are wearing the Highway 17 sweater is a total coincidence. Completely coincidental. I, I had no idea this letter was coming. Yes. And um, I wore this a few weeks ago, and I mentioned that 17 North, which is what this sweater says, starts in Nipigon, goes all the way to the western border of Ontario in Kenora. Yes. And there's a difference. Well, do I put it this way? There's a difference of opinion as to whether... 17, which of course goes all the way, as he says, from eastern Ontario all the way up through and past, and then that's how I get to Manitoulin Island when I go western Sudbury and so on. Yeah, but there's 17 north right. as distinguished from just 17. Right. Now, I suspect technically he's right, <laughs> and I suspect it's all 17 now, and they don't make a distinction between north, south, east, west, whatever. But since my sweatshirt says 17 North, I'm just trying to be consistent with what it says here. Yes. So are, are we going to cut me some slack here? Well, I will cut you some slack. And I will note to our readers that, I mean, you mentioned uh, your camp on Manitoulin. And your your uh, love of, of Northern Ontario is is uh, sincere and earned by many years of service. So, of course. Uh, this is not an issue of uh, uh, you uh, trying to uh, leave anybody out. Perish the thought. <laughs> Perish the thought. All right. Anyway, uh, this is fabulous. Do you remember before GPS, you actually, no, you probably don't. I do. I, do you I, remember I, these? You I, actually had to get these maps out and you had to open them up. And when you were driving the car and you had these maps open in front of you and you were trying to see where you were going, 
while at the same time not getting into a car accident? Let me tell you something. That was challenging. But this I, uh, is very nice I, I and do nostalgic. I uh, own a car right now, as, as uh, we've talked about before, but I, I did briefly own a car when I was in university, and it was just before like Google Maps became really like reliable and useful. And so, yes, I did own, I think it might still have it on a shelf somewhere, a uh, province of Ontario highway map. As, as everyone should. <laughs> that is the On Poly podcast for this April 5th, 2024. You can follow our show on Apple Podcasts, and you can watch the video version of the podcast on the TVO Today YouTube channel. Any feedback you have, we're happy to hear it, good, bad, or indifferent. Write us an email at onpolitics at tvo.org, and be sure to include your first and last name and where you're writing from. Until next Friday, bye-bye. See you next week. You were one of the participants for this pilot project. Can you remind us why you decided to sign up for the Basic Income Pilot Project? Well, with signing up to the Basic Income Pilot, they were looking to gather some data and to be able to measure if this program would possibly work. So it was a study uh, for our mental health, uh, healthy foods, uh, just work if that applied to folks. So it was getting involved in gathering data. And out of that, my hope was to help change and the stigma and show a need for basic income. Bonnie, you worked closely uh, with people who signed up for the pilot project. Is it a similar story that Dana had, had sort of just told right now as to why people in Thunder Bay were signing up for the program? Definitely. And of course, one of the other reasons was people were hopeful to be lifted out of poverty. They were hopeful that a decent income over the next three years, which is how long the pilot project was supposed to last, would be enough income and enough time for them to go back to school, get an education, a degree or a diploma, start a small business. So there were dreams and there were hopes. And that's what I heard mostly from participants that entered the project from Thunder Bay. I do want to ask you, Bonnie, you know, you were on the grounds signing people up. Reportedly, there was some skepticism about the program when it first started. Um, was it challenging to find people to sign up initially? Not at all. Actually, at the Lakehead Social Planning Council, where I work, we have a community volunteer income tax program that does where volunteers complete taxes for income taxes for people that earn a low income. And many of those people wanted to hop on. Now, of course, some of them who were receiving possibly, possibly ODSP, the Disability Support Program income in Ontario, were fearful that some of their expenses might not be covered if they were flying to Toronto every two weeks for treatments or whatever the case may be. There were some people that decided not to join, but the greater percentage of people did join and they weren't skeptical when they joined, they were hopeful. Tana, I actually saw you nodding your head when I was asking that question. Curious, was there a little bit of skepticism in the beginning or was it that uh, sort of description that Bonnie had given? For myself, I found a lot of it was anybody that was on ODSP. Hmm. I, I myself am a recipient of ODSP which, um, when the pilot was launched. So a lot of people thought that they would be punished or be lose their ODSP. So it was definitely reassuring people that there was, was with informed consent, it's like, this is what this is going to happen for you. You're not going to lose your ODSP if you decide to sign on. You will not have it removed from you when the program is over. So it was definitely going around my community and confirming with people, this is not what's going to happen because of myself and let them know my steps with being an ODSP recipient. And the information was shared lots. Jamil, get us started. How would you characterize the security threat that you believe or don't TikTok represents? Well, I think that TikTok does represent um, a security threat in a particular sense. I think all social media platforms do. Social media platforms collect a huge amount of information about their users, and that's certainly true of TikTok. Uh, TikTok maybe raises additional concerns because of its uh, connection to the Chinese government or its possible connection to the Chinese government. 
Uh, I think the real question is not whether TikTok presents a threat, but rather what the best way is of addressing it. Which we shall do. Taylor, how would you answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I, it sort of depends how we define a risk and a national security threat. I mean, there's certainly a capacity on these platforms to shape discourse and influence discourse, as we've seen um, in elections, previous elections on other platforms. There's clear potential abuses of data, um, as Jamil mentioned. There's a whole host of broader sort of health, public health issues that we could Im bring into our national security conversation, although I would sort of war not to. But there's also economic interest here. And the U.S. government, which bill or legislation we're talking about, has a long history of incorporating economic power and interests into their national security threat assessments, which is clearly happening here, too. Janice, do you see a genuine national security threat to Canada here? I agree with Taylor. Uh, the, of course, there's a security threat. Anytime you agglomerate and collect data in the way that all social media platforms do, the fact that it's owned by China, and there is no separation, um, adds an extra dimension. But on the spectrum of national security threats from China, this is at the very low end of the spectrum. And that's, I think, the bigger story. Connor. There are many more serious ones. Connor. I think those who study China understand that the distinction between a corporation and the government's interests is a legal fiction. In other words, it exists on paper, but not in fact. And what that means is that TikTok, its owner ByteDance, is controlled by um, a group of, of data kleptomaniacs. Um, and they should not be within a mile of, of controlling such a platform. The worst thing that American social media companies, and they absolutely should be reined in, the worst thing they're going to do really is try to sell you something. With TikTok, the threats are far greater. Let's follow up on the data angle. We are told that a quarter of Canadians use TikTok. So, Taylor, follow up on that. What sort of data can be mined given that reality? Well, it's the same kind of data that can be mined by any a large social platform that acts as an intermediary between our devices, mostly our phone, and our commercial and daily social activity on the internet. So it's well, every, the things we purchase, the, where we go, our faces in terms of facial recognition technologies that are embedded in these tools, um, our political beliefs, our act uh, political engagement and activity. I mean, it is a lot about us, which is why um, many people um, have been arguing for clamping down on some of those data collection capacities from a broad range of platforms. The question here is, I think what Connor mentioned, like, is there something different about this company collecting these data? I think that's at the core of some of these issues. How much confidence do you have in the current Competition Bureau's ability to reduce this phenomenon of greenwashing? Well, it's, it's an interesting period of time. We've had a couple of cases that have gone after a relatively narrow definition of greenwashing, but now we're seeing complaints, I'm sure we'll discuss more, that look at a broader definition, more about claims of overall business models, or a brand entirely. So it's really uncharted waters, I think. There have been some successes in the past, but they've been fairly narrowly defined. So I'm interested to see how these broader claims do under our, our current law. We will dive into all of this. Julian, how about you? How much confidence do you have in the Competition Bureau's ability to do something about this? I think it's it's their job. It's clearly in their mandate. Um, of course, they have limited resources. So the Competition Bureau does a lot of things. They do mergers. They investigate cartels. Uh, so all sorts of deceptive practices. Uh, they're really a, a watchdog that has a lot uh, a lot to do. Uh, but if it's not them, then who is it going to be? Uh, they're the only agency, the only federal agency that can uh, can address greenwashing at the national level. Uh, they have experts. They have professional investigators, so uh, we expect that they're going to, they need to do it, uh, because if they don't do it, then who else? They, okay, if not them, then who? Tanya, what do you think in terms of their ability to do the sound? I mean, Julie makes it sound like they got a lot on their plate already. They do have a lot on their plate, but deceptive marketing is really important for, you know, protecting consumers, making sure we have a fair playing field. And I think that if the federal government can really help the Competition Bureau out by, you know, setting some laws and rules that they could um, then enforce, because that's what they do, and I think that they will do uh, a great job of that. Let me mix it up a bit with you here, Phil, which is, what do you think prompts companies to greenwash in the first place? 
It's a great question. I mean, I think companies are starting to realize that sustainability is table stakes. A lot of people thought that it was going to be a passing fad. And if anything, since the pandemic, um, making sure that your business is sustainable has only increased in importance. And there are there is uh, certainly a, a desire for some companies to show that they're doing something and a temptation to take a shortcut, which is what greenwashing is. Becoming sustainable is very hard. It's costly and it takes real work. And some folks want to reap the benefit without putting the work in. But Tanya, presumably you do it because you think you will get away with it. Right? Is that why they do it? That could be a reason you could get away with it. Another reason could be that there's not enough rules and guidance and maybe some companies just um, need a little bit more help. And that's where the Competition Bureau could step up. They could issue some greenwashing guidance that really set some examples. We see that in other jurisdictions. Julian, is that right? I shouldn't necessarily be so nefarious in my interpretation here. Maybe they just don't know the rules well enough. Is that possible? That, that's possible. That's certainly possible. Uh, a lot of them are have good intents. They want to do good. They want to tap in in these new green markets. Uh, they want to attract consumers that are interested in sustainable products, whatever that means. Um, so, so yes, a lot of them want to do it well. And, and Tanya raises a very good point. There needs to be guidance out there. We heard a lot of companies who are... Uh, I've been doing some research uh, on this topic for, for some time. And many times I heard companies saying, we want to do it well. We're interested in making genuine environmental claims. But what does what does green mean? If I want to say that I'm making, um, I want to supply a green product. What does that mean? What's the bar? Which standards do I need to comply with? And that's really the challenge here. It's that there is legal uncertainty. Uh, the bureau net needs to step in and provide guidance. But of course, guidance is not everything. There's also needs to be some very concrete laws that can address this phenomenon. Next week on The Agenda. If instead of inspiring people to act, we're asking them to accept that the world is on the decline, I, I think, you know, that's not the right message. We know exactly what to do to save the planet and stop climate change, and, and today it's a political problem. That's next week on The Agenda.